Coming up next on Twitch, this week in computer hardware, AMD's Developer Fusion Summit. Lotto now or bulldozer later. Our favorite PC cases, cheap water cooling, Phenom Gaming, Connect SDK, and Gigabit from Comcast. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 124, recorded June 16th, 2011. AMD Strikes Back. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. And by squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. For a free trial and 30% off your new account for three months, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TWITCH6. Welcome to Twitch this week in computer hardware. I'm Patrick Norton, joined as always by the man, the myth, and the legendary traveler. I think travel is replacing benchmarks for Mr. Ryan Shroud. Where are you this week, sir? Uh, the anonymous hotel room that you may see behind me if you're watching the video version today is located in Bellevue, Washington. Uh, so up near Seattle, Washington area as well. Is this... Uh is this the Microsoft, is this like Microsoft's conference or an Intel conference? Where are you at? Oh, no, it's AMD. Exactly. Yes. Today, wow. uh, well, uh, let's see, Mon Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we, uh, I attended the AMD Fusion Developer Summit, which is more or less their uh, attempt to create a conference similar to what Intel does at the Moscone Center in San Francisco with the Intel Developer Forum. And it's their attempt to try to gather a few media, not a whole bunch of media. There was maybe a dozen total press here of, of the, what I would normally consider that. You know, some analysts, the, but mostly developers, software developers, that type of thing, uh, to, to really start to get people excited and interested in the idea of heterogeneous computing, which is the idea of using a CPU and a GPU uh, for multiple, you know, for, for appropriate workloads. Basically, you know, finding ways to use GPU horsepower where it makes sense and all that kind of stuff. Uh, now that they've launched their Fusion APUs on the desktop and notebook fronts, it, it, it is definitely the, the right thing for them to do. And so far, it's actually, or not so far, it's over now, but it was a very good conference. And we'll, some of the news bits that we'll talk about in the show today uh, came directly from it. So. Cool. I, I should say some people have been suggesting that I'm a little down on AMD these days. I'm actually getting very excited about Bulldozer. Just want to get that out there in terms good, of uh, good. <laughs> a, 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 a price-sensitive and inexpensive, a cheap, if you will, CPU option at Sandy Bridge. Twitch, T-W-I-C-H at twit.tv. That's the email address. That's the best way to send us your questions. We're going to get into those a little bit later in the show. In fact, we have a couple of case questions, the usual power supply questions, actually an unusual power supply question, and quite a bit more coming up. But we should probably start... Uh, well, with the AMD news, the, the A-series uh, Lano, the APU, the, is it Sabine, Sabina? What, what is Sabine, the, Sabine, Sabine is how we're, I'm being told to say it, I guess. <laughs> uh, so the, 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 the launch of AMD's Lano finally happened, at least on the notebook front, just this past week. I, actually, I guess it was on uh, Monday or Tuesday. Uh, Lano being kind of that mythical beast that we've heard about for probably two years or more. The f It was going to be the first AMD Fusion processor, combination CPU, GPU on a single die, bringing in, finally bringing in the benefits of the merger of the AMD and ATI companies. Uh, obviously, we saw the actual first released Fusion part was the Sakate platform that was like a netbook you know, really, really small notebook type platform that was uh, much lower performance than anything. It was mainly com com uh, competition for Intel's Atom line and that type of stuff. Uh, but we finally saw Lano, which is a desktop mainstream design. Now, the, the basic specifications of Lano are pretty easy to understand if you know about current hardware. It's a quad-core processor 
So it has four cores that are very similar to what you see in today's Phenom and Phenom 2 processors. So the CPU architecture is, 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 a, is a known quantity. Nothing really changed here. They're, they're claiming, you know, 4 to 5% increase in uh, efficiency per clock. You know, so modest changes uh, with, some, with some technical, with, with some memory controller changes and that type of stuff. Uh, the GPU portion is basically based on uh, the Redwood architecture of Radeon graphics cards. You can consider that something to be like the Radeon uh, 56 series, 5000 series class graphics in this. Uh, and let's see, the specifications on that are 400, there, there are several different versions of it, but the one that we reviewed, the most powerful one, is 400 stream processors or what they're now calling Radeon cores. Um, just you know, they got to get a marketing name in there, I guess, somewhere. <laughs> uh, and, and the GPU clock will run at about pretty much 444 megahertz or 400 megahertz. Just these are all obviously depending on which individual SKUs you you go with. Um, so it's not a whole lot of GPU cores, and they're not running incredibly fast speeds. But regardless of that, they actually perform very very well easily beating the integrated processor graphics that you find on Intel's Core i7 and Core i5 and Core i3 processors in the notebook uh, or desktop front as well. And, and, and you do get discrete level performance on the edge. You know, if you look at your 5600 series graphics from uh, Radeon graphics performance, you are getting that in a, the, a, an AMD processor now, and it's it's pretty impressive to to see that. It's not gonna for for people that listen to the show that want to do, you know, hardcore gaming or anything like that. It's not gonna replace that, uh, but it's definitely the best integrated graphics we have seen on any platform up until this point. So it's 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 pretty impressive. Uh, did you get a chance to look at any of uh, the reviews or the information about it? I mean, what were your kind of overall impressions? Of what, I get, of what you saw. I got to be honest with you. I was completely, one, I want to talk to you about the, the, the Trinity powered notebook that you saw demoed up there. I got to be honest with you. I was completely distracted um, this afternoon. You're like, you know, you're starting to look around, you're looking at news, you're looking at hardware, you're kind right. of pulling it together. And I found out the SDK for the Connect came out from Microsoft this afternoon. Oh, yeah. And that completely. Um, side Just play track. around that some. No, I I I can't hack my way out of a paper. I can't code my way out of a paper bag uh, on a good day. Uh, much less you know 20 minutes after downloading the the SDK for the Connect. But it's been it's been funny because they promised. You know, the Kinect came out November last year. They start selling like gangbusters and all of these crazy projects we've seen that are built around open source operating systems or Windows or anything else. They have all been done mm -hmm. by people, you know, kind of reverse engineering their way around and playing around with it. So back in February, Microsoft announced an SDK. They demoed it in March at uh, Mix 11. And you know, this afternoon, it's it it they've they've come out with the uh, the official uh, SDK. Quote, provides access to Kinect's raw sensor streams, which means developers can work with the high-speed skeletal tracking capabilities, depth sensor, color camera sensor, and the microphone array, and uh, oh, over 100 pages of high-quality documentation and sample code to, dis to demonstrate how to use the sensor. Channel 9 has a four-hour, which is Microsoft's dev channel, the four-hour broadcast. They're doing sessions on how to program to Windows using the SDK. Cool. And under cover of darkness, quote, they have been running a code camp here at Microsoft campus for the last 24, after, uh, 24 hours. So he basically, the people have been doing crazy stuff, uh, quadrocopter drones, uh, and all sorts of really fun stuff with that. So there's a really great article. If 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 I haven't bored everyone to tears already, check out Connect Hackers are changing the future of robotics it's by Jason Tans up on Wired. It's I think it was out of the Microsoft uh, or the uh, Wired magazine this month, um, but it's really interesting. Like, you know. The idea that the Kinect is is replacing these incredibly complicated, incredibly expensive laser arrays that allow robots to map the environment around them, but that the Kinect, this hundred dollar piece of soft or hardware, um, you know, allows you to create cheaply and without wasting a lot of computational power, mm -hmm. you basically have stereo imaging cameras that can construct three D maps for the use of your robot. So, my mm -hmm. robot geeking is over. I'm not going to talk about the the Connect. Let us go back to uh, AMD and the Trinity powered notebook. <laughs> well, let me 
I guess a, a couple of closing notes on the on the Lano issue, um, or not issue, but release. There there were two things that were interesting that came out. Uh, so if we look at the performance individually, the, the processor performance is not incredibly impressive. Uh, it gets beat pretty easily by the performance of the Core i3 and Core i5 processors, sometimes mm -hmm. by almost a factor of two. Uh, wow. It's, you know, th these are lower clocked phenom cores as well as existing phenom cores that have basically been released since 2007. So if you're looking at raw CPU benchmarks, you know, you're looking at like the Core i5 2500s scoring somewhere about uh, 34.5 gigaflops mm -hmm. and the AMD A8 3500M at about 18.7 or something like that gigaflops. So um, just you know, like just under half or, or just a little bit more than half rather of the CPU performance there. And that's pretty consistent across most of our testing. The graphics performance obviously is better. Uh, if we look at, let's see, you know, if 3D Mark 11 obviously won't even run on the integrated graphics on Intel's processors because it doesn't support DX11. Um, the, if we look at 3D Mark 06, or let's look at, at, at something like a game that you might actually play, play Far Cry 2, talking about the difference of uh, 32 frames per second and, and 45 frames per second, very improved minimums. Uh, the, the graphics is, is without a doubt faster in this. The power consumption is also very good. They were able to get uh, 10, I think we actually saw about eight hours of battery life on, on mm -hmm. this demo machine that we got uh, for Wi-Fi browsing, which is really impressive as well. And also, just for people who might be curious why we're not talking about it, the desktop version of Lano hasn't really been launched yet. That you will see uh, maybe the end of this month, first week of July. Uh, we'll be able to talk about that. They really wanted to focus on the mobile front here because they think that's where this product can be successful. And obviously, if you look at the CPU performance, when you look at a desktop system, when we start doing those entire uh, allotments of benchmarks and those entire rounds of benchmarks, it's not going to look good against even the desktop versions of Core i5 and Core i7 and that type of stuff. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that later in the month, maybe next month. But uh, definitely check out the review of uh, Lano over at PCPro.com if you're interested in it from a mobile form factor. And some of those machines are actually starting to be available this week. I, want, uh, I mean, you, I wonder... Oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, I was going to say, I wonder, you know, you, you look at Lano, you know, basically, you're disappointed. You wanted better CPU performance. Bulldozer is like a biscuit away. You know what I mean? We expect right, Bulldozer right. to show up, you know, end of this summer at the latest. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wonder at some level if AMD is releasing this part, you know, because they want OEM manufacturers to integrate it and use it as much. You know what I mean? Because nobody's building a notebook at home like they're building. You know what I mean? PC Correct. Per, you know, the PC per audience, the Twitch audience, the, you know, the hard OCP, the Anantech, whatever you want to, whatever your favorite hardware enthusiast site is, although personally right. I'll suggest PCPer.com for obvious reasons, the quality, uh, Ryan, of course. <laughs> um, but this is not an enthusiast part. This is, this is a part right. where you're installing it, you know, this is a low cost part. This is an inexpensive college notebook. This is an inexpensive home user notebook. This is, I am rolling out 4,000 PCs to the, you know, marketing department in Poughkeepsie, maybe not 4,000, but, um, right. you know what I mean? This is, this is AMD, you know, and what's interesting is I think about the biggest improvement between like the core two duo in my B2 snot MacBook that I've been carrying and working <laughs> here for four years versus my wife's year old MacBook air is it's not the faster you know, it's not the processor in the MacBook Air. It's the fact that the, the, the GPU is so advanced. I don't have to, you know, her old notebook was even slower than my MacBook. Uh, it, it had a, you know, it had a core duo, not a core two duo. So she'd have like 15 web pages open. And if three of them had flash advertisements, the CPU was cranking and the fan was howling and you couldn't right. hear the freaking home theater system. So... On some level, I don't think, you know, we have so much, if you're not editing video, if you're not playing, you know, Twitch-based 3D games, you don't need a lot of CPU power for basic right. computing. So maybe, you know, AMD's like, okay, well, this is a nice, you know, this is a nice price and position for us to be in where we offer a little bit more GPU, you know, a little bit less CPU, let's not talk about that, but we do it at a very <laughs> price. 
Um, you know, I, I personally, I would like a faster CPU and a faster GPU and all right. the battery life because I want the horses, the guns, the girl, and the money um, to misquote a really <laughs> awesome Western movie. But you know, I, I think it's I think it's probably going to do fairly well for AMD, and I think we're all kind of like bulldozer. Thinking about yeah, and, and what's, what's the good news? <laughs> the good news here is, uh, so you, you mentioned briefly the Trinity. They 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 at the developer forum here, uh, the summit. They they demonstrated a Trinity powered notebook for the first time. Now they showed up at Computex two weeks ago. They held up a processor and, and said this is Trinity. Now they actually had it running in a mobile form factor. Now Trinity is the combination of a bulldozer core. Bulldozer cores, you know, quad core bulldozer based processor and integrated Radeon graphics. So, this is the APU that will combine bulldozer architecture with the ATI Radeon core architecture. So, this, you know, then obviously we always kind of say this, but the next generation might, will, will be possibly what it is that you're looking for. Um, but it's good news. That's that's not till 2012 that we're going to see that part. Uh, we'll see the standalone bulldozer processor this year, but not the combination uh, fusion-based part. Uh, but it was good to see a demonstration of this at the uh, Fusion Developer Summit. You know, it was running Windows, it was playing back video. They weren't doing a whole lot with it. Uh, but considering this is very early silicon, uh, I think they did a pretty good. It was pretty good showing, saying here we're we're on pace to deliver one. Uh, mainstream consumer fusion developer, or I'm sorry, fusion APU per year, and uh, that that was cool. So maybe uh, maybe Trinity will be what you're looking for, not too far down the road. Um, you want to talk about tablets or take our first break and and thank our one of our sponsors for today. Uh, I got a quick question for everybody out there yeah. in the Twitch audience. Do you care about tablets? Do you want us, because there are so many, you know, it, it's kind of interesting, like RIM's obviously having trouble even with the playbook sales recently, but, um, yeah. you know, we've got so many tablets coming out over this summer and into the fall towards holiday shopping season. You know, do you want us to be covering these, keep you on top of tablet hardware, talk about that, or is that something that you don't really think of as, it's not a computer, it's a mobile device, although at this sure. point, the mobile devices are getting so powerful and so, I got to say, some of the stuff's compelling. <laughs> yes. I had my hands on one of the Acer Econias, and I was like, you know, it's like four, 500 bucks at Costco. I think it was like 400 bucks at Costco, you know, and it, you know, it felt fabulous. You know, the interface was working great. Um, do you, you know, ladies and gentlemen out there in the audience, do you care about it? Do you want us to, to talk about, keep you an idea and like what you should be looking for in terms of the 42,000 not iPads out there? Right. Because basically there's two models of iPad and there's 42,000 other tablet options out there with multiple operating systems that seem to be changing by the second. You know, if you care, let us know, twitch at twit.tv and we will heed your desires up to a point. Exactly. Because there's a point where you guys get really scary and we're not going there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go ahead and thank the first of today's sponsors, and that would be Netflix. Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly, which saves you time, money, and hassle. There are several easy ways to instantly access streaming movies and TV shows with Netflix. One, you can watch Netflix movies and TV shows on your Mac, PC, or iPad uh, which is which is really cool, the new iPad app for that. You could watch on your iPhone and some Android phones too. I have the HTC Evo 4G and it does work with the uh, streaming Netflix capability there. If you have a gaming console, an Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, or Nintendo Wii, you can watch Netflix right on your TV that way. If uh, you're not a gamer, you can watch Netflix on your TV with an Apple TV box or a Roku box. They're inexpensive, easy to use, and easy to set up to use with your Netflix account. Uh, with Netflix, you can watch movies and TVs instantly using any of these devices, and you can begin watching a movie or a show on one device and then finish it on a different one. It remembers where you stopped at. Whichever way you choose to access Netflix, you can watch as many movies and TV shows as you want, anytime you want, with one price. And you can cancel at any time. So if you don't find yourself using the service as much as you think you would, uh, you have the capability to cancel. No contracts, no commitments here. Try Netflix today, 30 days free. Go to netflix.com slash twit. Be sure to use this URL when you sign up for a free trial, netflix.com slash twit. We thank Netflix for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware, and we hope you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. So thank you again for that, uh, for their sponsorship. Woohoo! Indeed. Uh, let's... Hey. Okay. Well, I was going to say, there's one, there's one more bit of news that I thought was interesting from the Fusion Developer Summit that uh, we should at least mention here. 
Yeah, we're not a software show. Uh, <laughs> We're not very good programmers, to say the least, uh, but we recognize the importance of development platforms and programs and stuff like that. And probably the most interesting software announcement, uh, mm-hmm. from my point of view, made at the Developer Summit was Microsoft announcing a product called C++ AMP. AMP standing for uh, Accelerated Massive Parallelism, which is probably just so they could find something that was cool to, to have like the word AMP. Um, what C++ AMP is, is it, it, ex, it extends the C++ programming architecture into multi-parallel uh, heterogeneous computing systems uh, in a very, very similar fashion to what OpenCL does. So consider C++ AMP to be a competitor to OpenCL, much like you have uh, C today and C++ and C Sharp and all this other kind of stuff. Um, so this is Microsoft's entry into this market or into this field and with the intent of being able to address multi-core uh, GPGPU cloud-based infrastructures without changing the way that programmers have to write things. Um, there's very little syntax change when you're, when you're trying to take advantage of, of these highly parallel processors like discrete GPUs uh, and the, the GPU technology in a, uh, like an AMD Fusion APU. So the whole goal here is, you know, we, we talk about GPGPU applications and uh, most of the time we talk about video transcoding programs or video editing programs and that kind of stuff. And the reason why not a lot of other programs still will use the power of a GPU is that it's hard to program for. It's if you're if you've if you've been a developer for any period of time, if you've been in school for for programming, <clears throat> you've probably never had this this task assigned to you before. And so the idea is to have a a platform that will easily extend your application, your program, um, across these different devices. So as the Fusion APUs and as Intel's own integrated processor graphic chips like the Core i5, like Sandy Bridge, those types of things. Uh, are extended throughout the market, we want, Microsoft wants, everybody wants, the ability to take advantage of that hardware and utilize it in the most efficient way possible. And C++ AMP is an attempt to do that by taking care of all the hard work for you, or at least a lot of the hard work. Um, and let's see, they, they did some demos with it. You know, they showed a uh, physics simulation where here it is running on just the CPU. Now we've switched it to running on just the GPU. Now here we are running on both. Here we are running on an APU and a discrete GPU at the same time. Here we are running on two discrete GPUs all off one single compiled executable file. And that's kind of the, the, the promise of C++ AMP and of OpenCL, to be fair, uh, is to have write once, run anywhere type of capability. And considering this was a Fusion Developer Summit, it was very big news for these guys. Uh, and Microsoft did some cool things as well, announced it was going to be an open standard. So, you know, any compiler could implement support for the C++ AMP specification, which is good news. It'll probably be adopted more than, say, like C Sharp was. Um, so that it's good news for us as well, people who like hardware, because... Now we'll have uh, less like we'll be less likely to have hardware that won't be utilized for things. The GPU can do a lot more work than it's doing today, and programming languages like this are what's necessary for that to happen. So that was it. Um, <clears throat> you want to mention? I guess you had in here T-Mobile doubling the speed of its of its HSPA <laughs> Plus 4G markets. Yeah, I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, Two things were coming up today. Uh, Comcast made an announcement. T-Mobile made an announcement. T-Mobile um, basically is up to 97 4G markets because um, I'm, I'm deeply fascinated and desperate for more 4G out there. Um, but they did a software upgrade on uh, HPSA Plus. I'm not sure if it was because in some cases it's a software upgrade to the box at the base of the tower. In other cases, they replace the box at the base of the tower to oversimplify. But they're claiming um, they have... Um, doubled the average download speed, like 10 megabits per second is now going to be typical uh, with gusts. Some people have said, um, and on Gadget, they said 27 megabits per second on the on the Rocket 3.0 stick. So it's obviously hardware dependent, the performance you're going to see. Um, but uh, they basically added 42 new markets for the service. 
and that gets them up to, I want to say, 97. So Engadget says, quote, if you're lucky enough to call Albuquerque, San Diego, Salt Lake City, San Antonio, <laughs> or any of the other 38 new spots home, you're golden and maybe reading this a little quicker than that fella next to you. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> quote, if you've missed this ship, fear not. The expansion won't be over anytime soon as T-Mobile has its sights set on covering 190 million users by mid-year. And that's well, something that's kind of interesting watching um, – AT&T and Verizon and T-Mobile and Sprint all kind of fight back and forth over the 4G market and and trying to bring their version of 4G to as many households as possible, as quickly as possible, just never as fast as I would like. Um, the thing that really kind of blew my mind, I saw up on GigaOM, um, is the cable show is an annual gathering of pretty much everybody involved in the cable industry, the hardware manufacturers, the, the, the RSOs, mm-hmm. and all sorts of other stuff in between. And... Uh, uh, the, the CEO of Comcast, Brian Roberts, was showing off um, next generation cable broadband, which is one gigabit per second uh, to the home, which, of course, leads to the if you, you know, you can't tell consumers one gigabit per second. So they said they were able to download 23 episodes of 30 Rock in one minute and 39 seconds uh, <laughs> over a live 11 mile cable network. Um, obviously, <laughs> they didn't have that particular 11-mile cable network, A, capped, or B, throttled. Um, um, yeah. But uh, the, the uh, Ohm Malik wrote up the article on GigaOhm, and, you know, his incredibly sophisticated, underway, understated way of saying it is, quote, the cable industry is coming under increased pressure from fiber-based, net, fiber-based network providers who have the advantage of brand-new networks with higher capacities. Which is politely saying the fiber people are scaring the snot out of Comcast, right. who is the largest provider of, uh, of uh, you know, basically the largest provider of cable modem or I should say cable uh, 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 internet access over cable right now. So it's a new version right. of Doxis, which is a spec for cable modems. So what I'm really curious um, is whether or not that requires new hardware, and I don't think it matters because uh, the CEO was very adamant about pointing out that, quote, our revenue per customer has gone up as we have increased speeds and better broadband, which is basically means if we can deliver more bits to the house, we make more money. And I don't know how that reconciles with the cap. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but, hmm. But, you know, it'll be interesting if they can actually make gigabit cable uh, run over the existing cable network without doing massive hardware changes. That's good for everybody. And I think it means that they will either offer a cable modem upgrade with a tiered service or, well, it's going to be a tiered. They're going to make you pay for it either way. But sure. um, I like the idea of having a bigger pipe with Comcast. I just want to make sure they don't leave the little tiny cap in place on that one. That would suck. Agreed. Agreed. Um, there was another bit of interesting news came out kind of in the hardware world here about rumors about the X79 chipset uh, will have the ability to support both the 1366 and 2011 sockets. If you remember, uh, while I was in Taipei a couple of weeks ago, we, we came across this. We, we, were, we first saw pictures of the socket 2011 motherboards uh, for Intel's next generation of processor, the Sandy Bridge E, as it's being called, with its quad-channel memory controller. And remember we saw this motherboard from ASUS called the Danshui, Danshui Bay motherboard that had both a 1366 and a socket 2011 uh, socket. <coughs> a motherboard Excuse neither me. one of us wanted to own personally. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, the, the rumor is now that the, the, X, the pending X79 chipset from Intel will actually support both of those sockets. So um, <laughs> it, it basically means that what Asu, the, the, the kind of Frankenstein piece of hardware that uh, ASUS built and showed to us in Taiwan uh, could be built. It, it, it has the capability to, to exist. <clears throat> but I think what will more than likely be the case is we will see uh, motherboard vendors using an X79 chipset uh, and choosing which socket they want to include on it, right? So you'll have an X79 motherboard with a 1366 socket on it and an X79 motherboard with a 2011 socket on it. So uh, it will kind of consolidate the chipsets, maybe some of the the motherboard options and that type of thing. It also kind of uh, leads me to believe that there's a possibility that 
the 1366 socket might have more life in it than we than we originally thought. Um, that that maybe they're they're going to be releasing some more processors for that based on newer architectures that fit that socket uh, that we didn't know about. So that that's good news if you have a 1366 motherboard today. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, ho hopefully we'll see something come out of that. I mean, do you really feel like most of the socket upgrades were motivated by actual electrical deficiencies in the socket? I mean, in, okay, in, in some cases they they wanted more pins because the transistor counts were getting so ridiculous. But did you ever, you know, did you ever really think that? I, I don't know. I I think a lot of the socket changes are just to force people to upgrade motherboards and chipsets. Uh, is that just entirely too cranky, even for me? <laughs> it, it, it might it might be a, a little bit um, because. I think some of it might be, I think almost all of it would be electrically related, right? So if you, if you look at um, AMD's had probably the most stable socket platform and they still have been changing it, you know, 940 to 939 uh, socket AM2, AM2+, plus, AM3, and now an AM3+, plus, uh, but they have a lot of backwards compatibility. I think, um, I think if you thought, if they planned out better, they could probably have uh, prevented some of that. But I do think right. that it was more electrical issue because when every, you know, anytime you add a feature, move something around, um, then you, you change what electrical properties, what kind of memory output pins you need to have, uh, that type of thing, power input or output pins you need to have. Uh, because if you look at it, even if you look at... Um, the new Lano processors that are coming out, they are not, they are on a completely new chipset as well. So, and that is because they had to reroute pins for display outputs and all that kind of stuff that they never had to do before. Um, so that might be a more extensive case than, than we might normally expect to see. But I don't, I, I think, I think you're, you're not being totally pessimistic there or, <laughs> or whatever, but it's, I think, I think it's, it could have been easier over these generations right. to, to do that. So. It seems like uh, every so often I'm just staring at a motherboard and thinking, really, you couldn't put that processor on this board <laughs> that I already owned? So yeah. <laughs> we should probably take a moment to thank the fine folks at Squarespace who are bringing the show to That's you right. today along with Netflix. Squarespace.com. Squarespace.com is the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. Uh, they have an easy-to-use user interface for creating and managing a website or blog. They're optimized for both beginners and CSS experts. So if you want to get down into the nitty-gritty bits of the code, you have that capability, although it sounds like Patrick and I won't be the ones doing that. <laughs> there are hundreds of design templates to choose from, and you can customize any of them to fit your needs. So you can start with a template, edit from there, modify however you want, no problems. Uh, they have an iPhone and iPad apps for updating your blog on the go. They have online resources and special support team uh, to give you personal help 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's an all-inclusive service that includes several modules to build your website, like a blog module, a form builder, Flickr photo display, Twitter widget, those types of things uh, that have social media uh, connectivity in there so that you can uh, connect your website visitors to you know any of your pages uh, or accounts on Facebook and Twitter. It has Google Maps, a whole lot more. It also does website tracking, so you know how many times your site is viewed, and it has built-in search engine optimizing. It's permission access handling is included if you want to have multiple people writing and editing on this blog. It's built on a cloud architecture, which means you have benefits for speed and stability. Uh, if you get a lot of traffic, they have the capability to expand the amount of processing power that your site is, uh, has access to. So you don't have to worry about going down when you get a lot of traffic. Uh, you, can use, you can and should use Squarespace for all of your website needs. Build it, host it, update it anytime. For a free trial, we're going to implore you to go to squarespace.com. Uh, sign up for a free account. No credit card is needed. Just try it out and start building a website right away. And then if you decide to purchase it, if you use offer code TWITCH6, you get 30% off for three months. That's squarespace.com. And if you use offer code TWITCH6, T-W-I-C-H, the number six, uh, you can get 30% off for three months. And uh, I think you will enjoy the, the product they're offering there. And we thank Squarespace.com for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. Woohoo! Uh, let's jump into our emails, I guess. Uh, the Again, just to reiterate, for the third time, I think, today, uh, twitch <laughs> at twit.tv is the email address. Send us your questions. Um, you know, if you have maybe an interesting project that you've worked on, that you already have the solution that you think other people might be interested in, maybe you don't even have a specific question, feel free to send some of that in as well. Um, we're, we're always interested to see, interested to see what our readers uh, and listeners and viewers have come up with. So let's take this first one here from Bruce. 
Bruce says, hey guys, long time listener of the show. How do you feel about using a solid state hard drive on Linux? I know you've talked about trim support with Windows 7, but I am primarily a Linux user with GNOME as my primary UI. I am not a gamer. I use Linux, remember? But I wonder what sort of benefits I could get if I upgraded my 9500 GT to something more modern. Any suggestions? Wow, his GPU is actually considerably older than mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know what benefits. I mean, if he's not a gamer, um, and, and he's not doing any kind of 3D modeling or anything like that while in Linux, if the 9500 GT does all the acceleration, I mean, you might check and see uh, if, if GNOME has GNOME has uh, any kind of added performance benefits of higher end graphics. You might see maybe they implement some kind of UI enhancements or changes if you uh, update the version and then have a better graphics card. Um, you know, it's one of those things where I know in Windows Vista and Windows 7 what having a higher end graphics card will give you the capability to do, but I'm not exactly sure what it is in Linux. And I don't think there's a whole lot of push for higher end GPU performance in non-gaming, non-rendering uh, type environments right. in Linux. Well, it's, it's funny because like 2D computing doesn't really stress GPUs. You know, and when right. I say 2D computing, I basically mean 99% of when you're staring at a screen until you get to the Windows 7, the Aero UI, where you actually right. have physical 3D rendering going on. Um, you know, because it, it, back in the day, they used to cache graphical elements for the 2D rendering of Windows to take that off of the CPU and bring, you know, the, the Windows to you faster. That's what the, the video card was doing. It was specifically engineered, you know, first to bring video, then to bring the video faster, and then 3D comes and everything changes. And if you are not you know, this is probably something we say, hey, if you're out there running Linux, if you're out there running um, any other open source operating system, um, let us know if you're seeing any benefits, you know, to, you know, what 3D acceleration or is it taking advantage of, of the GPU to do other things the way, you know, right. video acceleration and stuff like that. True, um, true. To go back to the first part of that question, um, I love using solid state hard drives on anything that can access them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, in terms of, you know, and I know a lot of people who develop, um, I think the worst case scenario I've seen is a buddy of mine who started dual booting um, Windows on his, you know, Linux notebook to try to figure out a way to apply trim. Of course, it doesn't work right because the partitions are separate, but the, uh, which he of course discovered later on, but the, um, I can't believe the open source community hasn't figured out ways to opt to, or at least begin optimizing. It's funny because I was sitting here furiously in pre-show trying to find some references on that, but I'm, I'm, I would be shocked if nobody's doing anything with trim under Linux. Um, yeah, I don't. Hey, trim I don't on Linux, know if that's kernel the case. newbies. There you that's, go. Almost eight months old. So, Storus, Sadage, add translation for SCSI write same, aka trim support, add driver for Mac OI, IO, IDE controller driver. You know, mm. I think at this point, um, unless there's something I missed in the last release of Ubuntu, which is entirely possible, um, I don't think it's, you know, the open source operating systems sort of catch up to hardware. Um, right. But it's, Kernel team if, 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 it's, if it's not there, it probably will be um, right. soon. The other option is to use a drive that does uh, self-correction. I think the C300, the the uh, the Micron-based C300 and C400 drives have that capability. Um, so you can do that as well. Uh, but I'm trying to think here. I don't want to give any wrong wrong advice because if you get an SSD and install it, and then you upgrade your kernel later down the road or, or the driver that has trim support and I don't know if it immediately starts working or if you have to reinstall your OS or something like that. Um, but I, I don't think there's, you're not going to have any huge major problems with the modern drives without trim support right now anyway. And like I said, if you actually are worried about it, I would perhaps go with like a, the C300, <laughs> any you know, the, the crucial type uh, micron controllers that will um, support some of that that the uh, background garbage collection as well runs without having to have support in your uh, OS. So, 
mostly though we both love SSDs. No matter right. what you paid or did not pay for your operating system, I think it will make you a happy, happy critter, Bruce, in a Agreed. way that a GPU is very unlikely to. Uh, Arun had a great email about building a mm. Phenom gaming system. He says, initially I settled on a Phenom 2 X6 1100T or 1090T with an AM3 Plus MOBO, uh, HD 6870 and 8 gigs of RAM. However, I have read that the Phenom 2 X4 965 performs at a similar level as the higher end six core CPUs AMD has to offer. I was wondering if you would recommend getting the X4 965 and saving the 30 or 50 bucks, or if the six core CPUs will provide better gaming performance now and down the road. All of my heavy use will be in gaming, most notably the upcoming Battlefield 3. As a note, I chose an AM3 Plus motherboard so I could upgrade to Bulldozer a few years down the road. Good thinking. Mm -hmm. Also, if you have time, could you recommend a good case for a beginner builder in the $100 to $120 range? Thanks, Arun. So, um, I'm just trying to look up the specs here. So, the Phenom 2 X4 965 is an older processor. In fact, I'm looking at the Newegg uh, page for it, and it appears to be deactivated. So, this is a quad-core processor that runs at 3.4 gigahertz, 45-nanometer uh, process tech. The Phenom 2 X6 1100T is 3.3 gigahertz with 3.7 gigahertz turbo clock so mm -hmm. it'll go up to 3.7 uh but it's six cores and it's 199 dollars so uh, two things one the the x6 1100 t will be faster than the phenom 2 x4 965 it, it, because it's running 50 percent more cores at 100 megahertz less clock speed at, at the worst and up to a faster clock speed of 3.7 Right. Now, if you can find these Phenom 2 X4 965 still and they're on sale and, uh, you know, that's it's 100 bucks or something like that, then I don't have any problem with you going with that, especially considering that your main target here is gaming. Uh, Battlefield 3 will take advantage of multi-core processing with, without a doubt. Will it take advantage of six cores over four cores? Will you see any kind of performance advantages from that? Uh, tougher to say. If you if you plan on doing anything in the background while you're playing Battlefield Three, then I, I would I would see that option as well, uh, or that it would actually help you out there in that case as well. Um, but but yeah, I, I don't. I mean, he I says mean, that Frostbite two engine. Oops, oh, sorry. No, I was just gonna say he he says that he heard that it will have the Phenom Two X Four will perform at a similar level as higher in six core CPUs, and it's. It depends on what that what that workload is, but it, it can work out that to that way. So, no, nah, it'll be interesting. I mean, Frostbite 2.0 is the engine behind Battlefield 3. I guess technically they haven't released the exact specs for Battlefield 3, but people know what Frostbite 2.0 uh, is going on. So, you know, the recommended the recommended CPU is a quad core. I think. You know, I'm torn. You know, part of me is like, if you plan on doing any video editing or you'd like to run 82 things simultaneously, an extra two cores right. would be nice. But, you know, 30 or 50 bucks could make for more memory. Do you think eight gigabytes is too much? Should you go with four gigabytes or? No, no, I think I think I think we're, we're starting to get on the edge here where four gigabytes is is, is probably more than enough. Um mm -hmm. But if, it, if you're not getting the higher priced over like super overclocking memory, the, the price delta between four and eight gigs is fairly minimal. So I, I if I were building if it was if it were me and I was building a system today, I would put eight gigs in it. Um, okay. just because of future proofing type of options there. So future proofing is usually a smart thing to do. Um I, I will say I, I have recycled many, many cases. In fact, um right. there was a while where I kept finding these amazing ATX cases on the side of there's this recycling system where I used to live in San Francisco where people leave things at the curb. Uh usually because I lived at a corner. Uh people would drag things down the block and leave them in the corner in front of my house, which is really awesome because somebody left a couch there once and uh I put on gloves and an overcoat and wrapped it with a garbage bag and drug it back in front of their house, which really pissed them off. Mm -hmm. uh, on the flip side of I've, I've acquired a number of really spectacular bomb proof cases. I really like Antec nice. cases if I'm paying money. Mm -hmm. Um 
you know, the ATX 600, the ATX 900. I also kind of come from the spend no money on your case and spend all of your money on your power supply, your CPU, your GPU, and your memory and motherboard. Yeah, the, that's, I think there are a lot of people that do that. Um, I, I like to have a, 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 a a specific case I like because I, I, I'm inside the computer case a lot, so I want to make sure it's kind of a place I feel comfortable uh, that, uh, you know, has, has all the amenities that I might need. Uh, John, who's, who's our board up here, rec recommended he likes his Thermaltake V6 Black X edition. Uh, this is one that has a built-in three and a half inch hard drive dock built into the top of the case. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's actually pretty cool, and that's actually on, you can get it on Newegg for like eighty bucks. That's a good option. Uh, and if you're going to wait a little bit, uh, at Computex, Corsair showed off the wow, I can't remember the name of the series at all. Um, uh, Obsidian, no, not Ob Obsidian. Maybe it is Obsidian series of cases that they'll have a ninety-nine dollar and one hundred and thirty dollar option that has a lot of the features that uh, the hiring cases have, like good cable management, uh, mm -hmm. easy cable routing, that type of thing. So, um, if you're interested in, in waiting a couple of more weeks, then you can check those out too. So, to uh, to expand on what you were saying about being inside the case, I will say, if I am spending money on a case and I'm paying attention, which you should be. Mm -hmm. A case that has minimal screws to open it, like two thumb screws at the most, um, decent cooling access in the front, removable filters that allow you to slide a filter in and out to get the cat hair or the dirt off of it. My <laughs> favorite feature uh, on a motherboard these days is the ability um, – a, a case that I, uh, I bought recently had basically an access door on the bottom. There was a, a the where basically where the ATX motherboard mounts on it. There was an access port on the back side of that, so you could actually remove uh, CPU coolers without having to remove the K or the uh, without having to remove the motherboard yep. from the case. That's yep, my single nice. favorite upgrade to a CPU case ever. Um, you know, because I, I had a couple of Blackbird cases that I ended up giving away. As much as I loved those cases, these amazing, monstrous, 70-pound cast aluminum, amazing airflow-managed cases with built-in yeah. water cooling, um, they were just so heavy I couldn't stand moving them uh, around the house one more <laughs> but time. But you could stand on it, Patrick. You could stand on it. You could dance on it. You could probably throw it <laughs> through the front of a tank. But uh, <laughs> at some point I realized, you know, I didn't want to work on the floor whenever I was changing anything in and out of that computer. So uh, nice. I moved on to a couple of other uh, frightening cases. So <laughs> Let's hopefully see, have, uh, a rune that helps I'll you out. I'll take this email from uh, Gavi, Gavi, G-A-V-I, about an editing ring. It says, hey, Ryan and Patrick, I've been pushing off upgrading my system for years. I built it in 2004, but it still runs well-ish. And now that I will be starting college in a few months, I will be learning video production and graphic design. I think it's time to do an overhaul. Looking for a system that will be able to handle the Adobe CS package, including Premiere Pro and Avid, and I kind of feel lost on what I should put an emphasis on. Do I need a strong GPU or a powerful processor? Do I need a ton of RAM or is two to four gigs enough? Should I look into Sandy Bridge? I need something that won't leave me hanging, waiting forever while wondering, uh, and will let me multitask while doing it. And please don't say just buy a Mac because I really like the option to be able to upgrade and configure my hardware. Also, the iMac 21-inch uh, um, cheapest cost 1800 bucks and goes up to $5,400 for the 8-core Mac Pro. Cheers from Israel. Um, I guess the first thing I'll say is I don't know if we've ever, ever said just buy a Mac on this yeah. show. So uh, I, no I, issues there. I, the only reason anybody will tell you to just buy a Mac for video editing is because Final Cut Pro only runs on the Mac, and Final mm -hmm. Cut Pro has be kind of become a de facto standard in a lot of uh, actually Hollywood movies and uh, television editing facilities um, because it's so much less expensive and it's still so capable compared to a lot of the tradition like the traditional avid would be uh, platforms. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm with Ryan. I don't think you're. I personally would love to see our department move from Final Cut Pro to Premiere. Uh, mm -hmm. As part of the you know hardware savings, and because I think some of the the management on on Premiere was actually thought out rather than sort of kludged together at the backside. 
Right. Some of that's changing with a new release of the Final Cut Pro, but you know, I can also find think of myself being beaten to death by a couple of our editors because they've spent the last four or five years of their lives working 40 or 80 hours a week inside of Final Cut Pro, and they know how it works, and they know how to fix it, and they know how to make it faster, and they have templates built, and they have all this cool stuff going on. So for them, moving from Final Cut Pro to another platform is uh, frightening and scary and would involve giving <laughs> up a lot of 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 things they have done to learn how to edit faster. Um, yep. <laughs> so yeah, don't, we're not going to say just buy a Mac. No, uh, unless I, I think, I think for looking at the actual hardware that, that you should be looking at, yes, you should be looking at Sandy bridge um, for the Adobe CS, including premiere pro and avid. The most important components are your processor and probably memory. The right. uh, more powerful processor, the more threads it can handle at one time, is, is your, is, that's when you're going to see the most benefit. He didn't really give us a budget here. Uh, so look, I would, if I were building a new one, I would maybe look at, um, you know, whatever the, what is this, the Core i7-2600K, which is a quad-core hyper-threaded part. Uh, that's going to be very, very fast for video encoding. Um, you can mm -hmm. get a GPU that is capable of doing encoding and stuff, but I'm not, I'm still kind of, I, I don't want you to spend a whole lot of money on a Quadro or a Fire Pro card unless, you know, you're, you're going into college, you're not doing this as a, in a professional uh, set, uh, setting yet. So I think those are a little bit overpriced. Um, you can right. do some research and find hacks that will let you use, say, uh, a GTX 580 or a GTX 570 as a GPU accelerated component in Adobe CS5 and CS5.5. So you might want to look those up and see which uh, which of those hacks, which GPUs those hacks will work with and buy one of those GPUs so you have that capability. Uh, and in terms of memory, no, four gigs, if you're, if two to four gigs is not enough. Uh, we just recommended to the previous person that they get at least eight gigs and I recommend it you, especially uh, doing video editing and, and Adobe, uh, Adobe, uh, Adobe CS work at all. Uh, you have a minimum of eight gigs in that machine as well. Memory uh, is always important for editing in those types of devices. The more memory you have, the less it has to go to disk. And that even if you're using SSDs, that's that's way slower than than what you're getting out of memory. So um, uh, that I mean, that's kind of a general idea of where I think you should go. Uh, you know, unless you had like a really tight budget then we might have different options. But um, I, I think, especially if you built your system in 2004, you're going to be really impressed with what you <laughs> get out of building a Sandy Bridge system uh, of any configuration type today. Four gigabytes, two gigabytes, eight gigabytes, you're going to be freaked out. Uh, yeah. Definitely definitely go for a larger than four gigabyte system for video editing. Um, <laughs> Nick has a question about the GTX 460 GPU and the Xbox 360. He says, hi guys, at the age of 41, I'm finally getting into gaming. I started my PC gaming adventure with Portal 2, which I enjoy immensely. I have a DIY Core i7 box with an NVIDIA GTX 460 video card. As I browse gaming websites, I am told that my video card is utterly lame. However, I find it hard to believe the $200 Xbox 360 has a better video capability, yet it seems perfectly capable of playing even the latest games. What's the deal? Please enlighten me. Thanks, Nick. He also adds, by the way, I totally blame you guys for fueling my need for upgrading my PC like all the time. <laughs> um, man, you know, the gaming forums, it's, it's a lot of what I like to think of as locker room talk or, or, mm. or like, you know, desert racing forums or the worst ones are car forums. Like, oh my God, dude, here I am like, did your vinyl 2270s that are like totally not appropriate. And it's like, he won the world championship on them. Really? You know, um, I, I don't know. I, I, I think of, of or the Jackie Stewart was being interviewed by some jackass at a car magazine. Um, Jackie Stewart, of course, uh, having won several uh, world championships, uh, Formula mm. One world championships. And somebody was like, you know, you don't break the right way when you're going into terms. <laughs> Bob Bondurant says, and Bob Bondurant's a very talented, you know, teacher of, of race car driving, you know, and in Jackie Stewart, it's like when Bob Bondurant has won, you know, umpteen world championships and he can tell me how to drive. Fair enough. People talk smack in the forums, you know, people talk. And that's smack. what's I mean, happening look, the, here. The Xbox 360 
you know, it's a valid gaming platform. It is one of the two largest gaming platforms on the planet when you're talking about consoles. Um, compared to the PS3, it is nearing the practical end of life for its graphics. Um, the PS3 has got yeah. s- some more room left, but the X, you know, saying that the Xbox 360 is going to kick your PC's ass, well, maybe if your PC has like six-year-old graphics. Um. Yeah, the GTX 460 is not that old. If somebody, if somebody oh. tried, to, if I don't know if this is how, if it was, if it's just worded badly, but if somebody tried to tell you that the Xbox 360 graphics was uh, more powerful than the GTX 460, they're wrong. Um, and yeah. and when you say that the Xbox 360 has no problem playing the latest games, that's true, but it doesn't play them at the same quality settings necessarily that you're running on your PC games. It doesn't necessarily play them at the same resolution as well. Uh, the GTX 460 is still a good video card. Uh, mm-hmm. It doesn't really matter if somebody tells you what GPU you have is lame. If you're playing on it and you're happy with the performance you're getting out of it, and you know if you're playing titles like, especially if you're playing titles like Portal 2, you don't need much more than a GTX 460 to play that game with all of the settings maxed out. Now, that being said, if you're going to play like Battlefield 3 coming out this year, um, then you then you might if you're if you want to get the best possible image quality settings, then you probably will want to upgrade. Um, but you don't have to spend a whole lot of money to do that anymore. You know, if you spend 250 bucks on a graphics card. Um, you know, you, you can get really, really good options. You know, the 6950 from uh, AMD's Radeon collection or uh, like a lower-end GTX 570. Those types of things are all accessible easily. But, I mean, the GTX 460 is still a heck of a card, and there are a lot of people playing games today on a lot lower-end parts than that. Absolutely. Yeah, I, 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 I'm just – everything that Ryan just said, you know – People people like to talk smack about other people's hardware sure. and software. The reality is, there's a lot of people, you know, you know, if you're not running three monitors or like a 30-inch monitor running at, you know, 2,500 by by you know 1,900, you don't need a gigantic GPU. You you know, even you know, unless you're going to turn everything on, it's just it's just people. There's a lot of people who have more hardware than their monitor can handle. Right. Um, yeah, true. And and that's just that's just one of those things where you know and, until until we start getting inexpensive 27, 30 inch high resolution monitors that are running like 25, 60, um, we're just not. It, it you know what I mean. I just yeah. find it really frustrating. People are spending a lot of money on cards and then running them into 1080p monitors that can't even remotely handle uh, <laughs> the amount of bits the cards are capable of fueling. Yep. Um, quick one for Peter about USB video adapters for gaming. He says, apologies if you guys have answered this question previously. Can you advise if it is possible to use a USB to video adapter for multi-monitor gaming? My guess would be no, as I expect these actually work as a discrete video adapter, and thus a game won't work across multiple video adapters, sans SLI or Crossfire, but thought you would be able to confirm. Thanks in advance. Love the show. Cheers, Peter in New Zealand. Um, yeah, Display Link technology is cool. They they basically own the technology that turns uh, a, a video signal over the USB port into an HDMI or a VGA or a DVI signal that your monitor can interpret. And mm-hmm. generally speaking, they are you know not appropriate for high speed, high resolution Twitch gaming. Correct. Um, I mean, yeah. it's you might think that. The, I mean, the, the GPU, if, if you've got a display that's not hooked up to your graphics card, um, with very few exceptions, the GPU is not powering the, the screen that is being shown on that, right? So if, you, if you're using like a display link output, it doesn't have the capability, doesn't have a, a graphics technology to really render games and stuff really well. So it doesn't simply act as an output device. It's also doing uh, actual graphics work on that chip. So um, I think we had this question a couple of weeks ago where it's like pretty much, I mean, if you're, if you're doing 2D gaming, if you're playing uh, uh, pinball type games on, on Steam and that kind of stuff, you'll probably be able to get away with it. If you're doing anything that is 3D related, very much not recommended. Right. Um, yeah. I just want to make sure we've stated that abundantly and clearly, and I promise we will not bring it up again. <laughs> For a while. <laughs> For a while. For a while. You want to take uh, Roderick's question? Yep. 
Yep, we've got uh, one more email to get to. It says, great show. Keep, uh, Patrick, keep your head up. The dental work will be done just as, uh, just as you have to start paying for braces for the kids. So that's good news. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I want to get rid of my cramped old e-machines case that houses my system because I ran out of money and said, what the hell? I can't fit a video card in the case, and my onboard graphics are reaching their limit with my MATLAB programming. My motherboard is ATX-sized. How big a pain is it to switch cases? What advice do you have for doing it? Any recommendations? Finally, what is the best off-the-shelf liquid CPU cooling setup you guys would recommend? My stock fan is way too loud. Did I mention I ran out of money? Thanks, Roderick. Um, okay, first up, um, you know, yes, moving to a new machine is always nice. Uh, it is pretty much as complicated as building the machine the first time because you have to remove everything from inside the case, uh, right. including the motherboard, and then transfer it piece by piece into the new case. So it's almost actually more complicated than building a PC for the first time. Although, and you know, it's basically depends on is, is getting the stuff out of the packages from the manufacturer harder or getting the stuff out of the existing PC. At least the stuff's clean when it comes out of the plastic from AMD right. or Intel or Seagate or Western Digital or who have you. Um, ATX is the most common side of motherboard. We talked about uh, 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 ATX case recommendations earlier in the show. Um, so finding an ATX case will be easy. Um, mm -hmm. Switching cases, you know, if you've never built a computer before, give yourself three or four hours and a kitchen table, preferably with something thick and padded on it, because there's nothing more embarrassing than finding you have destroyed the surface of the formal dining room table because somebody leaned over on the motherboard and all the little tiny pins on the mother of the bo on, the, on the bottom of the motherboard on top of the incredibly expensive dining room table. Um, you know. Personally, if if uh, you're mentioning I ran out of money, I would go for a air cooler rather than a uh, water cooling system because air cooling is a lot less expensive and astonishingly good and astonishingly quiet. Um, I've got a thermal right code gauge True Spirit in my main system, which is awesome because it made my CPU fan, it's much quieter than the original CPU fan I had. And it's not awesome because now I know how loud the two K <laughs> the case fans are in my Antec 900 system. <laughs> nice. Um, for liquid CPU, uh, you know, for pre-made liquid CPU, there's probably pretty only one name that's currently shipping. Um, and of course I can't find the current price on it. You're talking about, like, talking about the Corsair items? Yeah. Is anybody else shipping a sealed system right now? Um, yes. We've got, of course, you've got Ace Tech uh, and Cool It that actually manufacture the ones for, um, like, uh, Corsair. I would say, I think you can get this for, like, 60 bucks, $65 now, right? Uh, oh, okay. If you look, if you, if you get the less, um, you don't have to get the newer, higher-end ones, ones that are going to cool. Um, yeah, you can get uh, the Corsair H60 for, well, $69. So it's a little bit on the high side uh, for your processor was, I cooler. I thought, they were, I thought they were still selling for like 100 so. Oh, okay. Um, and actually, the H50, which is the original one, is uh, $49 at Best Buy's website. So wow. you can even get it cheaper than that. So. Hey. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's uh, Newegg has it for 69 Best Buy, which is a little bit unusual, has it for $49.99 um, on sale. So, that, I mean, that's, that's definitely going to be quieter. It's going to have at least the efficiency of some of the better air coolers as well. So, And not that much more expensive than the $40 Thermal Right Co-Gauge True Spirit I was mentioning. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, exactly. Wow. There you have it. Twitch at twit.tv. That is the email address to find us. You can also find us on the Twitter at Patrick Norton, at Ryan Shrout. Mr. Shrout, when you return to beautiful Kentucky, what will we find on pcper.com? Wow, it's, it's been so long, I don't even know if I still run a <laughs> website. Um, I know we're going to be start testing the desktop versions of Lano, um, and we'll probably have several of those motherboards up as well. We are finally going to have uh, some Additional phone and tablet reviews, BlackBerry Playbook, Nexus S, things that we have talked about on the show before, but we definitely have a lot of that coming up. And I believe we're going to have some follow-up. Oh, one thing we didn't talk about this week that we learned about at the Fusion Developer Summit is AMD gave away a good amount of information about their upcoming graphics architecture that will be released later 
in 2011. So we'll talk about Ooh. that next week too. And uh, what do you got on Techzilla or HD Nation this week? <laughs> Uh, next next, next HG Nation coming up on Tuesday next week. Uh, we have a sad, sad story. A, a young man's college apartment was broken into. They stole everything. I think he literally has like two pair of pants and a couch left. So we talk about the best $500 HDTV out there. Um, we've got uh, great deals on camera gear and how to make your own OS 10 Lion boot disk coming up on the Techzilla that went up today. And we talk about emailing a 30 gigabyte file and quite a bit more. So. Cool. Well, one other thing I'll mention here, somebody in the chat reminded me, is that uh, QuakeCon is coming up August 4th through the 7th, I guess. We will be hosting a PC Perspective hardware workshop there again. So if you're in the Dallas area or just want to go to a giant like 1,500 person LAN party, uh, go to QuakeCon.org and check it out and sign up and see what you think. Uh, we'll be there. Peace Perspective will be there. A lot of hardware companies and stuff will be there. This should be a good time. Just want to get that news kind of out there and circulating uh, before we get too close to the <laughs> event. Plan your travel now, ladies and exactly. gentlemen, to hit QuakeCon and touch Ryan. <laughs> Just gently, please. I know I'm fragile. <laughs> That's it for this edition of Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Ryan Schrout. See you next week on Twitch. To grab it, but I have been playing with this. Uh... The new the EPAD transformer from ASUS. So Ooh. it's an Android tablet, but it has like the keyboard attachment and supposedly 16 hours of battery life and that kind of stuff. So you can see the, the tablet and the keyboard are separate here. Android 3.1 on it. Um, I was my plan originally was to try to use this as uh, my normal like device this week while I was here at the show. Um, but it didn't really work out. I had to do, it turns out that uh, you can't do quite as much on Android as you can do on Windows still. Go figure, right? So we're still giving it a shot, but it's, it's, it feels just like a netbook. Um, you know, you just, it's just, it's just and, and using Android 3.0, using Honeycomb uh, is just, it's, you know, for productivity, it's just not the same as Windows still. You know, trying to type out an article or news post and that kind of stuff in the web browser or in the uh, uh, office suite that comes with it. Just not, not, not the same.